Hi, I'm Shade. Welcome to Coffee Bookshelves. Today we are talking about Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. I first became aware of this book because I am obsessed with the Korean actor Lee Min Ho and I like to follow him from drama to drama and I heard through the grapevine that he was going to be in this new adaptation of this celebrated novel called Pachinko and it was being shot by Apple TV, it was going to be done in three languages, Japanese, Korean and English and it was getting the big Hollywood treatment. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to watch this, but before I watch it, I want to have read the book. So I got the audio book and I listened to it and it was just it was spectacular. It starts in the 1800s and it spans four generations of a Korean family and takes you from Korea to Japan to the US and ends in sort of 1989. So it's got a huge canvas. Now, the things I don't know about popular history could fill an ocean, but I did not know that Japan had colonized Korea. Um, they occupied the country from 1910 to 1945, and that's on paper. I mean, I'm sure that the incursions probably started before that, maybe in the late 1800s. But while they were there as an occupying force, they had a ton of oppressive policies, as imperial powers are wont to do. Um, Koreans weren't allowed to speak Korean in schools, in universities in public places. They were encouraged to do manual labor rather than pursue education. It was criminal to teach um, Korean history from non-approved texts, and you can imagine what the approved texts were saying. The Japanese burned thousands of Korean historical documents trying to wipe out their cultural history. They stole land and redistributed it to Japanese families and settled them there. They forced um, the Koreans to take Japanese last names. They, during, when the Second World War started. Um, they forced war conscription on Korean men. They had to work in factories, in mines, or fight. And the women were forced to become comfort women, things like this. And then after the Second World War ended, Korea was divided into two occupation zones because it had been forced to fight on the side of Japan. And the southern occupation zone was uh, managed by the US and the northern by the USSR and China. And it was supposed to be a temporary arrangement but in the 1950s, the Korean War broke out and the country has not been whole since. And all of this history sort of features in the timeline of this book. So it's about a girl called Sunja who was born in the early 1900s in a small fishing village near Busan to you know poor parents who run a boarding house for seasonal fishermen. And she's got you know like a very basic life. Stuff happens, I don't want to give you any spoilers, but she ends up marrying a missionary and following him to Japan. Um, and there they have kids, they survive the Second World War, and um, their kids or sort of grandkids end up in the US um, seeking greener pastures. I feel like it's a book about how colonized people survive you know, an imperial power, especially if they're forced to live in the land of the colonizer. I think it's also a story about little people, about you know, people who aren't government officials and they aren't Fortune 500 CEOs. They're just regular people living small, quiet lives. And, you know, saying small, quiet life sounds nonsensical in some ways because nobody lives a small, quiet life. You know, if you were to step into somebody's shoes and live life from their perspective and be full of triumphs and joys and tragedy and difficulties, and it would be full of drama. I think that the author is amazingly good at just opening up all these different lives to you. So she does a lot of head hopping. She will write from lots of different perspectives so that you really get to know these people. Even though she might only give you a snippet, you know you know what their goals are, what their challenges are, and you become invested in their story. So it's almost like a collection of short stories with Sunja's narrative running like a thread through it. Colonization is about exploitation, about extracting wealth from a place, and as a result, that impoverishes the people there. Koreans seeking a better life were often forced to go and live in Japan, where the Japanese people there were like, why are these people coming over, taking our jobs, 
taken our houses, you know, all the usual, right? And it was a very hostile environment for them. They would pay the Koreans less. They weren't allowed to live in certain neighborhoods. Their children were mistreated in schools. They were over-policed. And there were all these negative stereotypes that abounded about them. I've got a few quotes from the book that I kind of, I felt like, like summarized um, just you know how they were treated you've got this um, policeman who you know says Koreans caused trouble then made excuses um, there's a Japanese woman who says Koreans could be insistent like unruly children they could be loud and desperate with none of the coolness or placidity of the Japanese so you know they think that they're far more sophisticated and civilized than the Koreans um, there's a Korean character who says all my life I had people telling me Korean are angry, violent, cunning, and deceitful criminals. Um, and, you know, trying to fight back against his stereotypes. And then a father telling his child, a man should look his best each day. For Koreans, this was especially important. Look clean and well-groomed. In every situation, even in ones where you have the right to be angry, a Korean must speak soberly and calmly. And why? Because, you know, each Korean has to represent all Koreans when they interact with the Japanese because they were judged as a monolith. You're not treated like an individual, like a human. Um, and, you know, you've got to counter all of these negative stereotypes. So Sundra, you know, her children are born and raised in Japan and they speak Japanese just like the natives and they have the same culture, really, because they've never been to Korea, yet they're treated like outsiders. Um, and when I got to this part of the story, I left a message for my best friend. In fact, I left her a series of messages and I'm sure she was just like, please stop. <laughs> She'd also read the book, but I'm like, I felt like the author, Min Jin Lee, was talking about us, um, you know, at this dis the displaced descendants of people who have been colonized. Like, she's Filipino, grew up in the UK. I'm Nigerian heritage, grew up in the UK. And you grow up kind of, you know, confused about your identity, feeling excluded and not quite sure why. And because it's not necessarily a violent, you know, rejection of you or mistreatment, it's... it's actually very quiet sometimes it's just you're excluded like you know your products aren't in the hair in the hair shops um nude doesn't mean your skin tone it just doesn't apply to you the makeup counter doesn't have your shade of foundation like you know you're not in the storybooks you're not on tv um you're invisible unless you are the drug dealer on the tv show or you know, the in the crime section of the local paper, it's always people who look like you who are the petty criminals, right? So you are a negative, you're problematic, you're dependent. Why are you coming here and taking stuff from us? And, you know, you feel like, you feel burdened by this, like, you... <laughs> It's very hard to deal with, right? Um, and I just kind of wondered, gosh, like, is there a colonizer guidebook, like an imperial power guidebook that they follow? This is how you treat, you know, the children, the descendants of the people that you colonize to make sure that they never feel comfortable in your, on your territory, right? But I felt like Min Jin Lee was telling our story. Um, I felt like she did such a good job of capturing like the sense of disenfranchisement and identity crisis because you're like, I'm not from here because they're constantly telling me that I'm not from here. But I'm also not from there because maybe I've never been there, like, you know, where my parents are from. Or I've been there but not often, and maybe I don't speak the language well, I don't understand the culture well, so I don't fit in there either. So am I Nigerian or am I British? Am I Korean or am I Japanese? Like, it's a, it messes with your head. And I felt like Min Jin Lee did such a good job of capturing that sense of confusion. There's a scene in here that I felt like it was a really good demonstration of the situation for Koreans in Japan, where um, the, basically, I guess, the Koreans had to register for an identity card age 16 and it's something that's usually given to foreigners but Koreans even if you're born and raised there needed this ID card as well and it was just like another way of telling you that you don't belong and um, I again don't want to give too much away but the, a, the girlfriend of a character goes with him um, as his son goes to get his identity card you must have known she paused you must have warned him I mean you told him that today would not be so easy she didn't mean to be critical, but after the words came from her mouth, they sounded harsh, and she was sorry. No, I didn't say anything to him. He opened and closed his fists rhythmically. 
I came here with my mother and brother Noah for my first registration papers. The clerk was normal, nice even, so I asked you to come. I thought maybe having a woman by him might help. He exhaled through his nostrils. It was stupid to wish for kindness. No, no, you couldn't have warned him. I shouldn't have said it like that. It is hopeless. I cannot change his fate. He is Korean. He has to get those papers and he has to follow all the steps of the law perfectly. Once at a ward office, a clerk told me that I was a guest in his country. When Solomon were born here, yes, my brother Noah was born here too. Anyway, the clerk was not wrong and this is something Solomon must understand. We can be deported. We have no motherland. Life is full of things he cannot control, so he must adapt. My boy has to survive. And I felt like, you know, that they'd gone to this, um, this, this bu bureaucratic office to get these registration papers and all the clerks had just been very rude to them and, you know, ignored them, kept them waiting. And there was nothing that you could say, nothing that you could do because it would just make it worse. Right. So you've just got to endure this sort of dehumanizing treatment. And I think Min Jin Lee does this brilliant job of showing how people could just be cogs in this machinery of um, of making people feel excluded. And they're not doing it out of a, a sort of over malice or cruelty. It's just, this is just the thing that they're doing because this is what we do. Um, and I feel like she does a great job of giving everybody their full measure of humanity. Like people have, do things for reasons and they don't necessarily reflect on those reasons. Um, but for the person who is being sub subjected to it, it's cruelty. But for them, they're just like, well, this is how we treat Koreans here um, because they're problematic people. And they never get the sense of, you know, each each piece of cruelty adds up to this sort of tsunami of difficulty that these people then end up experiencing. The author says that, I find that in life, even the most unsympathetic person has a clear delineation of his motives, however complex and un unappealing. And I felt like, again, that was just another piece of the richness of this book was that part of the head hopping was not just the Koreans, it was the Japanese perspective as well. And, you know, just seeing, you know, life at this time from all of these different perspectives, just really gave you such a great immersive sense of, you know, Japan at that time, Korea at that time for these particular people. The book is a tour de force. It's surprisingly easy to read, deceptively so, because it does so many things spectacularly well, like the scale of it, the time frame, story, the emotion, like the historical insight and the way that you get so invested in the characters is all done so incredibly well. Uh, I haven't actually watched the show yet, which is interesting because that was the impetus for the whole, you know, for actually reading the book. Um, but I feel like the book was so powerful that I haven't quite gotten over it yet. I did watch episode one and it looks wonderful, but I was like, oh, I'm not ready for this yet. Also, there's something that happens in the last quarter of the book that I definitely have not, <laughs> I am not ready to revisit yet. And if the show was linear and I could be like, oh, I'm just not going to watch the last few episodes, I might have watched it by now. But, um, but it's non-linear, so it bounces back and forth in time and you never know which time period the next scene is going to be. And so I'm like, oh, it's, it's very Roberta Flack strumming my pain with, you know, with her fingers in terms of the, the author. I'm not ready yet, so I'm going to have to wait a while. But I will get around to watching it because it looks spectacular and also Lee Min Ho is in it and he is super hot and super talented. But the book, Uniquely Brilliant Pachinko by Min Jin Lee.